Hello and welcome to the startup procedure of the C-130. When you're starting to learn this on your own, it's probably going to be a good idea to have the checklist up with left control plus C. This is a panel that you'll become very familiar with, especially when dealing with the cargo menu, but that's for another time. So I would suggest that you bind this to your HOTAS somewhere if you can. If you press this button here and select any of the checklist items, you will get visual guides to help you along. However, I won't be using this today. Let's get started. The first thing to turn on are the oil cooler flaps, which need to be in the down and auto position. Failure to set these will result in a fire on startup. Next is the battery test. Testing to the left checks the avionics voltage and to the right will check the utility voltage. We are looking for 24 volts with 22 minimum. Now we can turn the battery on. This will start its power on sequence as it supplies power to the DC avionics and DC utility buses. Let's clear the master caution warning. When you hear those dings, you should probably turn your attention to the ACOS page, which stands for Advisory Caution and Warning System. You will see warnings of abnormalities listed here. This caution just lets us know that we are currently discharging batteries with no external power on. On the electrical panel, we need to turn on all four generators. This will open the generator relays. On the ice protection panel, we set the four propellers to auto while leaving the engine, wing, and epinage switches to auto as well. The pedo and windshield NESA heat stay off and they will come on during lineup procedures. Next, let's check that the bleed air panel switches are all set to auto. On the far right, we have the pressurization panel, where we need to set the pressurization mode select switch to auto. Below that is the fuel management panel, where we double check that the left and the right dump valves are closed. The remaining switches are set to feed fuel correctly. Next to the stowed HUD, we have the exterior lighting panel, where the navigation lights are set to flash and the top strobe light is set to red. To the right of that, we have the FADIC control panel that allows each engine's FADIC unit to be changed to reset. We will come back to this panel to reset them after the APU is started. Below that is the prop sync switch, which should be set to on. This controls whether the automatic propeller synchro phasing is active or not. To the left of that is the ATCS switch, which is the automatic thrust control system that limits asymmetric thrust between the two outboard engines at slow speed to reduce minimum control speeds. This will be left in the on position. Next we have the fire handles, which should all be in and the engine start switches should be in the stop position. Likewise, on the APU panel, the fire handle is also in, and the switch is in the stop position. The ELT or emergency locator transmitter should be in and pinned, and the wipers are in the off position. Going down, we check that the gear handle is down and locked. The landing light motors are also in the middle or hold position, with the lights themselves in the off position. The anti-skid switch should be switched on, but the auxiliary pump needs to be in the off position. Below that we have the pilot and the co-pilot control lighting. You can set these as desired. Now between these we have the radar panel where we need to make sure that the master switch is in the off position. Now it's time to start the APU. This is a spring-loaded switch, so we will click once into the run position, and then we will click and hold in the start position until the green light appears, and then once it appears, we let go of the knob. Once 
once the RPM climbs up to 100%, the APU is started. Back on the electrical panel, we will select the external power selector to APU, which will power on the AC buses. In turn, those buses provide power to the transformer rectifiers, which will then supply the DC isolated and DC main buses. This is also a good time to talk about the lighting system in the C-130, which is designed in a way that if you see lights on, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing. However, it does indicate a non-standard position. Thus, if you see a light on, it generally means that you should take a look at it and confirm that it's correct. The big screens in front of you are called the Heads Down Displays, or HDDs. The smaller screens on top are the Avionics Management Units, or AMUs. In the middle of the AMUs is a special screen called the COM Nav Breaker Panel, or CNBP. We are currently in the ECB, or Electronic Circuit Breaker section, and we need to reset some breakers. However, we first need to bring up the CB page on one of the HDDs. The way to do that is to type the HDD number of the screen that we want it on. I'm going to use HDD2. And then we hit the HDD button to place the CB on HDD2. With the ECB page up, we can see all the current pulled and open circuit breakers that get pulled before shutdown to prevent fires. To reset them, we will enter all the ECB number sequences at once like this. And then we will select Reset, where we will need to hit Reset again to verify the selection. If you were to reset each ECB one by one individually, then you will not need to verify it. To go back to the previous menu on the second HDD, we just simply need to click on HDD2 option, which will bring us back to the previous screen. Up in the bleed air panel, we will select the APU to open it and bleed air pressure will come up. Behind the throttles, we have the trim elevator tab, which needs to be set in the normal position. Failure to do so will cause the aircraft to have no trim, and subsequently, this means no autopilot. It's a bit easier to move over to the co-pilot seat for this to access the air conditioning panel, where we will turn on the underfloor to fan. Back in the pilot seat, we will just glance over at the fuel management panel just to make sure that we have the correct fuel amount. With the APU now running, we can go back to the FADEC panel to reset it. We can reset each one where a reset signal is sent to both FADEC units to clear all fault indications. Now we should probably reset the NIUs as well. Go to the AMU and select Engine, Engine Diagnostics, and at the bottom, NIU Reset. Each engine possesses a Nacelle Interface Unit, or NIU, which provides signal conditioning and processing for the engine, nacelle, propeller, and engine monitoring system sensors. It's a good idea to reset this after APU start for all engines. By now you have probably noticed the attitude fail message, which is due to the fact that we have not done an alignment yet. So let's turn our attention over to the CNI. This is called the Communication Navigation Identification Management Unit, or just CNI for short. The buttons on the side of the screen are called soft keys. Meanwhile, the buttons with words on them, those are called mode keys. That's like the Comtune, Navtune, IFF, etc. On the right hand side, you're going to see AutoNav, which by selecting it, we can initiate the EGI alignment process using the position which is displayed to the left of it. In this case, we have GPS selected, which should align us roughly between about four and five minutes. You will note that it is in big font, and then when you select it, it changes to small font. The big font is used for data inputted by the crew, page headers, active branching prompts, and active selections. Meanwhile, the small font is used for system computed data, inactive branching prompts, and inactive selections. So in basic terms, when you see small font, it's something that was inputted by the computer, so not you. 
And when you see big font, it's something that you manually overrode or entered in in that field. Now, if you would like to know the status of your alignment, then you can press nav control, then next page twice, and then at the top is EGI1. Here you're going to see mode and it's gonna say align, which means that it is currently still aligning. When that changes to NARF, you are fully aligned. To go back to that previous menu, hit index, and then at the very top, hit power up. Now we can turn on master avionics, which applies power to the navigation and communication radios, except for the high frequency or HF radios. It's important that you understand that you should only turn this on after auto nav is done. Although technically a full INS alignment doesn't need to be done before the master avionics switch is turned on. It will be enough just to wait until there's headings on the PFDs, which doesn't take a long time at all. On the first AMU, let's select engine and then engine diagnostics. On the second AMU, you're gonna see the engine data screen. This screen is gonna be your best friend in order to understand what position your power levers are actually in. As we don't really have throttles in the C-130, the difference is that a throttle controls fuel and a power lever schedules horsepower through the FADEC and controls thrust by modulating the propeller pitch. My throttles on my desk are currently at my idle point, and as you can see, the PLA is showing 0.1. Now this is indicating that we are actually in the reverse range. What we want to do is move our power levers to the ground range, which is anywhere between 17.5 and 33 degrees of power lever angle. Now a word of caution, the engines will not start if the power lever angle is below that range. The beta will show you your current blade angle, which is currently at 90 degrees for all engines as you can see here. FIC is the FADEC in command that shows you which channel each engine is in. Below the power levers are the low speed ground idle buttons. In normal ground range, the propeller spins up to 99%, but in low speed ground idle, it spins up to 72% with slightly different engine parameters. Be aware that the generators do not function while you are in low speed ground idle, and the APU is picking up the slack here. On the hydraulic panel, we will hit the auxiliary pump to on. Then, turn on the suction boost pumps for util and boost. Failure to turn this on prior to engine start may cause damage to the engine-driven hydraulic pump. At this stage, we have essentially completed the power-up checklist. Before starting up the engines, we would now start our cockpit setup flow and checklist that sets up things like the CNI, loading the routes, setting up the HUD, etc. and so forth. However, for the purposes of this tutorial, I will skip this for now and proceed directly to starting the engines instead, where we will go to the engine start section. And we will fire up the third engine first. This is usually done as it's opposite of the crew door. Functionally speaking though, you can start whichever engine you wish first. We will do this by clicking into the run position, then clicking and holding into the start position until the green light appears. A white box appears around the third engine display with a clock that shows the starter is engaged and running. When the timer runs out, the starter has finished but the engine will continue its startup process. Let's start the fourth engine. Click into the run position, then hold in the start position until the green light appears, and then you let go. Light, box, clock. At 21 NG, we have light off, and the engine will accelerate up, and the propeller will unfeather. There will be some fluctuations as the engine does its thing and should settle around 72% with beta at ground idle stop. The variations in some of the numbers are normal, as in the real aircraft there is quite a bit of noisy data. Now let's start number 2.
finally, let's start number one. And as a side note, nope, you cannot start multiple engines at the same time, as you will run out of bleed air. Alright, let's bring up the heads up display, or HUD. Bring up the brightness knob to turn it on. Select TACT, which activates the tactical data layer, and NAV, which activates the navigation data layer. If we wanted to operate the ramp door from the cockpit, we would not be able to do so right now, as we have weight on wheels protection turned on. This prevents us from lowering the ramp. We can override this protection by heading on over to the AMU, main menu, and pre-flight on the second AMU. Now we see ramp door WOW, or weight on wheels, override. By selecting override on, we will override the protection, and we will be able to open the ramp. As a side note, the Loadmaster is not limited by this override protection, and they can operate the door from the back as they please, since they can see out the back to ensure that nobody's actually behind a ramp. And let's go ahead and not forget to uncage the backup ADI. Alright, and effectively, we are done. Essentially, at this point, you have started the C-130 and you're ready to go. I hope you found this useful, and I will see you guys on the next one. Cheers.